chapter 18 tonight, 1 Timothy 1, 18. But before we begin our Bible study, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. It's a time to use the rebound technique if needed. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's bow our heads together for a few moments and I'll finish this out in a group prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we're delighted to have our freedom and be able to come together as Christians without persecution. We pray you go forward with us in your word this evening. Make it a source of encouragement and also challenge. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We finished the introduction and now we're going on to the field orders for young Timothy. I'm going to read our verse 18 in the New King James and then we'll take a look at it in the original. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. We're going to have a lot of correction here, uh, as the translation is not great. So, let's do it. The first phrase, this charge, comes from the Greek pronoun utas. Utas means near at hand, plus the accusative singular of paragalia, which means a command, a very strong command. It is to be, be obeyed without question. It demands instant obedience. So, Paul is going to shape Timothy up real quick, and he uses the word paragalia to get him, get his attention, and let him know Paul is speaking from his own authority, and that Timothy needs to straighten up, he needs to stiffen up under authority and listen and stand at attention. And I don't know what it is about my childhood, but I was very blessed. I've never met anybody who had a better childhood than I did. Uh, it raised under perfect conditions and the perfect amount of freedom and discipline and love. And But as kids, we knew when to stiffen up under authority. And we could tell when it was time to say yes ma'am and yes sir and and uh, obey commands swiftly. You could tell when it was in the air and this is the time for Timothy. He's recognizing, okay, Paul's listening to stand him up straight and give him some direct orders. And um, I pity the person of the young child who never learned how to stiffen up or straighten up under authority. It is a principle that needs to be taught to our young people, and it's part of good manners and uh, uh, even reverence in the local church. So uh, make sure that you teach your kids respect, and uh, you can't spoil your children by what you give them. You can give them a, gold, a silver spoon and a bugatti, and every toy that ever could be imagined, you can't spoil them. You only spoil them by not teaching them to respect. And the richest child in the world can be taught to respect. And Timothy has respect for Paul, and he's going to stiffen up now under uh, authoritative commands. I commit is the present middle indicative of paratithemy. This is a banking term, which means to deposit. He is making a deposit. 
It should be translated, I am depositing this order. The present tense is action in present time. The middle voice is indirect middle, stressing the agent Paul as producing the action. He's using his rank as apostle. The indicative mood is declarative for a direct order. Unto thee is not really correct. It's the dative case indirect object of the personal pronoun su. And it should be translated with you. So he's leaving a deposit with Timothy or with, him, with you. Son Timothy is the next phrase. Technon. It means son. Uh, you, if you study the words uh, for physical growth in the Bible, you'll, you, you'll see the different terms, napios, nursing infant. Um, bra uh, no, brafos is nursing. Napios is toddler. Uh, and then you have technon, children or child. And then weos, uh, adult son. So technon can mean son, but right here it has it also has another meaning, student. So we know that it, Timothy is not all son in the flesh. Timothy's dad was a Greek and an unbeliever, and uh, Paul has has him under under his wing, but he never he never adopted Timothy. So he's not his son. What is he? He's a student. Technon means student under authority. Teaching is a job for the pastor teacher. Technon means a student without portfolio. Timothy is Paul's student. Paul is using his academic authority to deposit a series of commands with Timothy and at the same time with us. Remember, this was recorded for us also as part of the Word of God. According to the prophecies, which is another bad phrase in the English, there were no prophecies out on Timothy. This is the preposition kata plus the accusative plural of the present active participle pro- Ago, participle is sometimes used as an adjective, and so it is here. It should be with reference to the previous. Final word is a noun that comes goes with the participle use of the adjective prophetia, which refers to the Old Testament doctrine. All taught Timothy. So with reference to previous Old Testament doctrine you learned. In other words, Paul is he's saying, look, what you learned from me, you're fixing to have to apply. I think I want to stop right here and... When we're in the world, and this is the devil's world, I don't know if you know it or not, and it's full of false information. And that's how Satan works. He distorts truth. He gives a parallel truth. He gives a, a he clouded truth, mires it down, bogs it down. And uh, he distorts every truth from the Word of God, and he even uses Christians to do it. This is Satan's world. And when I read this and I studied this this evening, I realized that there were some old guys who taught me things from the Old Testament too, and that they have stuck with me. And guess what I got to do? I got to apply them. There is a there's a new uh, a new form of theology out right now, which wasn't out forty years ago, but it is now. 
and it's called uh it, it's creationism but it's called a new earth or a young earth theory where christians e even in america some in australia new zealand believe that the earth is only 6500 to 8000 years old and um they'll go through and they tell you a lot of science but when you study the Old Testament and when you studied with the colonel, you learned. In Genesis 1.1, Barath Heath bara Elohim, in a beginning God created, and he did so perfectly so that everything was created nice and perfect and in perfect balance. And then in verse 2, there's a drastic change. Tohu wa bohu. Darkness and void. And it says darkness covered the face of the deep. So what happened between Genesis 1 1 and Genesis 1 2? And unless you're looking at it in the Hebrew, you don't catch on. In the English, it doesn't come through. But in the Hebrew, it's dramatic. A perfect creation and then darkness. Uh, the earth is formless and void is how it's translated. And darkness covered the face of the deep. How could God have a perfect creation and then have darkness and formless and void, frozen, if you will? And so when you understand the angelic conflict, you'll find out that Satan, Lucifer, was kicked out of heaven, the fall, between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. And that's where you get ohu wa bohu. And at that point, God begins to restore the earth for man and his habitation on the earth. And he goes through six days of restoration, not creation, restoration. And then he places man on the earth because we're living in a spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. That means that thousands of years could have transpired, even hundreds of thousands of years between Genesis 1-1, the original creation, and Genesis 1-2, and Tohu Wa Bohu. Now, I was taught that a long, long time ago. And it, see, studying in the original languages gives the Bible the most respect. The respect it deserves. And it uncovers these types of truths. When you just read it in the English, you can't get it. And all of these people have come out with their new young earth theory, and it's rubbish. Rubbish. Even when you go to the gas station and you put fuel in your car, it's speaking truth to you. There was a previous creation that is no more. So, Timothy is, Paul is telling Timothy, you're fixing to have to go to war for the truth. And guess what? The gap theory between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2 is now being attacked. And I am to go to war for the truth. Now, I don't have a lot of listeners, but that doesn't mean that I'm not responsible to teach it. You understand the gap theory now. And now in your mind, when you hear the young earth theory, you say, that's trash. Y'all don't know the Hebrew. You need to listen to a pastor teacher. I was going to give you another example, but I think that one's vivid enough. Let's go on. Which went before on thee should be communicated to you. So Paul communicated Old Testament doctrines to Timothy. It's the preposition epi plus the accusative of the personal pronoun su. 
Happy uh, plus the accusative emphasizes direction. He was taught these things. They aren't about him. They are taught to him. This is a reference to Paul's academic teaching of Timothy. Timothy had been Paul's theological student. Paul now commands Timothy to apply what he has learned. Timothy must be influenced by doctrine rather than by evil. Doctrine must become Timothy's life. It must become more important than anything else in life. And that has not occurred just yet. He is ahead academically. He's behind in application. The next phrase in order that is the conjunction hina, purpose clause, and the final clause, which denotes purpose, a goal, or an objective. By them, mightest war. En, that's the King James Version, by the way. En plus the pronoun altos. This means by the same Old Testament doctrine, with this present middle subjunctive of stratuo. It means to enter combat, to serve, and so on. The present tense is customary present to denote what may, may be reasonably expected to occur when you have doctrine in the soul. Did you know that? Yeah. Here's, here's my wife and I were talking the other day. Do you think that rapture is going to happen? And, you know, that would be a, a uh, little bit of a glorious thought. You know, we're in America, we're kind of going downhill pretty quick, and uh, things are not looking that great. And uh, it sure would be nice to be delivered by the rapture. But the truth is, and I told her this, I said, God would not leave all that doctrine in the souls of American believers without letting them use it. And the truth is that there are a lot of believers still in America that have some truth. And uh, if you were going to go trade your car in at the dealership, would you go fill it up with super unleaded and then drive it up there to trade it in? No. It's valuable. And God is not going to leave all that doctrine in your soul without letting you use it. And the beauty of that situation is that you are benefited and God is glorified. And so we're stuck, we're, we are right here in the United States of America and we're in a, we were praying for revival and now we're, it's like, almost like we're in a funeral procession for our own country in a state of mourning. But the truth is that the United States of America is not mentioned in biblical prophecy and that we're going to get to that status. We've got to get there somehow. And it may just be our generation that sees the fifth cycle of discipline fall on America. And... Uh, Timothy is the same situation. He is going to get to fill up with doctrine, but he doesn't get to just cruise. He get, he's going to get to apply it. And I pray that you will get to apply your doctrine also. And uh, the rapture generation is certainly a glorious thought, but just think, those people don't get the dessert. And the dessert of life is dying grace. God pours out wonderful and glorious blessings in your life beyond imagination as you stroll right from this phase two on into phase three. The middle voice is the indirect middle emphasizing Timothy as producing the action as the agent rather than by participating in the results of the action. Then we have the last phrase, the cognate accusative stratia. It's another word for war. 
which means combat or campaign. And with it is an adjective also in the accusative, kalos, which means honorable. Does not mean to fight a good fight. It's an idiom for honorable combat experience. That's the problem at this point. Timothy does not have honorable combat experience because he has not learned yet to apply the doctrine he has in his own soul. All right, let's get a good translation then. I am depositing this order with you, student Timothy. That's quite a bit different than what my English says. On the basis of previous prophecies, that means Old Testament doctrines, taught to you. in order that by the same inculcated doctrines you might have honorable combat experience. Paul is telling Timothy it's by the truth that you and I learn together in our studies that you are going to succeed in your ministry. I like that because I've learned a lot of a lot of things from from uh, some old guys and they did uh, a lot more work than I did to get uh, along in ministry and they didn't have computers and some of them didn't even have electricity to get us the truths that uh, as we know them and understand them today. By those truths, we're going to be honorable on the battlefield. So we're going to get some points of summary from this. And... Um, I'm forever grateful to the guys who did a lot of work. Um, I spent quite a bit of time listening to Dr. W.O. Vaught, and uh, he was, uh, he had discipline, and it's because he grew up on a dairy farm, and they would get up at 3.30 in the morning and light lanterns and go out feed the milk cows and get them milk. Both of his parents were teachers and they would go and teach school all day and then they would come home and repeat. And many times it was 9 or 10 p.m. by the time they had all the cows milked and fed and turned back out. And he, he, he did this every day as a young man and he would talk about taking that lantern and there being a beaten path to the silo. The dairy cow, has, they feed them silage, chopped corn is basically what it is. And his job was to get in the top of the silo and throw down the silage for the cows. So he learned how to walk the dirt path to the silo without getting snake bit. And he knew to hold, he was in Mississippi, he knew to hold the lantern out to light the path and then climb the side of the silo and throw down the feed. And he applied that same discipline to his study of the Word of God. And he spent many meticulous hours not only studying in the original, but come to find out that he listened to the colonel and his exegesis quite often uh, every day. And Dr. Vaught uh, taught on TV. I can't remember what channel it was. Was it 4, 7, or 11? But on Sunday morning, you could uh, watch TV and you could listen to Dr. Vaught teach Bible doctrine. It was an amazing deal. And uh, I'm very grateful that uh, he 
was disciplined enough to crank out some truth. And if you go into the uh, library back here, you'll even see some of his hand-typed notes that were given to me indirectly. Let's take some points of summary. This first order deposited with Timothy embraces the entire epistle, whole letter. Every command from now on in 1 Timothy is a new paragraph in this field order from headquarters. One of my uh, favorite phrases that Paul gave Timothy was endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And that means adversity is inevitable. Stress is optional. Hard times will come. Pressures will come. Adversities will come. But you will endure. You're a good soldier. You're going to high step through adversity. And you're going to apply the 10 problem solving the de devices to each problem you face. Not fall apart and have a pity party is what he's saying. And not uh, be weak and timid. And uh, you're going to have to learn how to endure some hard things. Point two, Paul is the professor and Timothy is the technon student under strict academic discipline. I love it because uh, I learned a lot from old guys. I, I, I got to hang around with more old guys than most kids. And it was, I think it was because my dad loved old guys too. I had uh, neighbors. Marzell Taylor and Efton Taylor. You knew them probably. They were yeah, your neighbors at one time. And Marzell kept a pack of beech nut right here in his bib overalls. And he kept a chaw all the time and it kind of ran down the creases of his mouth. But he also had a wad of money that would choke a mule. I don't think he believed in banks, and he carried it with him everywhere. Straw hat, and he was constantly wheeling and dealing. Well, my dad told Marcel, my boys would like to have a horse. Do you know where we could get one? I do. Along comes a Shetland pony, black one, named Midnight. And this Shetland pony was a fine animal. He was slick as a button now. And he loved feed. And he loved pets. And carrots and all the things that horses like. He had one tragic flaw. When you got on his back. And got you a handful of mane. He would take off like a lightning bolt. Towards Marzell's house. And he would stop right just before the barbed wire fence to send you through it. So we had some wild adventures on this horse that Marzell sold us. And, uh, of course, we didn't know anything about breaking or training a horse back then. And then Efton Taylor was a, uh, he was a, he was a real old timer. He raised all our show pigs. And uh, he had a hog breeding operation, and Dad would buy. Uh, Efton would. He he knew he had he knew how to set up a hog operation, and he knew how to set it up where the mama wouldn't get on top of babies and smash them, and he knew how to uh, cut the eye teeth off when they were certain days old, and he knew how to take care of all the male parts on some of the ones that he wasn't keeping for breeding stock and so after so many weeks 
he would wean those pigs and deliver them to my dad. And I think my dad paid $5 a piece for these pigs from Efton Taylor. And uh, they lived just across the highway. And one day we drove over to Efton's pasture. And I, I was really amazed as a kid because they had a small square shed set up out in the pasture. And under the shed was a mule and he had a beam across his back and he was walking in circles. And then out to the side, they had huge mounds of cane, Dargham cane. And this mule was running a horse-operated press, and they were feeding that cane in there. And the juice from that sorghum cane was coming down a little chute. And right out there in the pasture, they had a piece. They had a piece of stainless steel turned on both edges, about ten or twelve foot long, and it was it was just enough hill where that sorghum. It started out clear, and they had fire built under this chute. And it was coals under there. And that sorghum was cooking while it was rolling down that chute. By the time it got down to the other end, it was that dark sorghum molasses, and he had jars sitting right out there in the open pasture, jarring up that sorghum molasses. And I... I, when I saw that as a kid, I just, I was bewildered and perplexed and just amazed that they were out there making sorghum molasses. And I witnessed that as a child, and I don't, will anybody ever get to see that as again? We're not gaining technology, people. And that was Efton Taylor. And these two guys were uh, amazing men, and they lived just across the highway there from us and uh so i have a real respect for old guys and the things they know and uh if you slow down long enough sometimes you you'll find one that can teach you something paul's teaching timothy point three the combat experience is a reference to timothy's ministry in ephesus that's coming up and the whole surrounding area related to the angelic conflict. Point four of summary, honorable combat experience reduces itself to the believer in phase two or time being influenced by Bible doctrine rather than by evil. And the youngest generation is so confused about life, they've forgotten there's only two chromosomes available to the human race, and it's male and female. Created he them. And then just a basic truth from the Word of God. That could help a whole lot of people. Not to mention the Bible promotes the idea of making your own way in life. Your volitional responsibility. You're responsible for yourself and to pay your own way. You take a wife, you're responsible for her. You have children, you're responsible for them. But not only that, the Bible says if you have living family, you ought to be looking out for. And uh, the person who doesn't take care of his own family is worse than an unbeliever. And just if you just took a few of those facts uh, and applied it to our welfare system, you would see that uh, we could turn honorable in the United States, but we are very dishonorable, and we are influenced by evil rather than doctrine. 
Point five, the believer influenced by doctrine receives blessing, which glorifies God. God is tapping his foot waiting to bless you. The question is, do you have the capacity to receive the blessing? Somebody said the Powerball was up to a billion. If you won the Powerball, would you say, so long, God, I'll see you in eternity? The believer influenced by evil receives cursing and discipline in the plan of God. So you may be born you may be born again and you may believe in 43 genders. You may be headed to heaven and you may believe that tripe. You may be born again and you may be very liberal in your political stature. You may not believe in volitional responsibility. You may not believe in pulling your own weight, having a career, whatever it may be. It's obviously driven by jealousy, and the person receiving somebody else's money is never happy. Well, there's the cursing and the discipline that comes with these ideologies. The believer influenced by doctrine reaches super grace or spiritual maturity. That's where logistical grace bravo kicks in. God gets to pour out the, the finer things in life to you. I never forget one year I was out doing control burns. We had an area where Bill we'd done some work at and it was the growth was kinda new but it was a little bit open, had the right amount of sun, but I'd burned it. And that spring there was a crop of dewberries. That's the lower bush that that grows along the ground, not the not the blackberries, which is a taller bush. Came on right there where I had burned at, and I guess the, that that fire released the right amount of nutrients and had the right amount of sun. We literally had a berry crop right by the house. That was phenomenal, and it got. You know, the moisture, the heat, everything was just right. We were picking those dewberries big as your thumb. You couldn't make it into the house without having a little blue around your mouth and eating all these things. I didn't do anything. I didn't plant them. I didn't cultivate them. Actually, destruction is what I did, burn. And that's how God's grace comes to us. You never know where it's going to, which angle it's going to hit you from. The believer influenced by evil passes through various stages of reversionism and divine discipline culminating in the sin unto death. See, the point is, learn some doctrine and don't be influenced by evil. We're having a big, big problem with the ideology of borders and nations right now. Look, God created nations. And he did so to keep the earth from being destroyed. And inside those nations, he had 
languages and races to begin with. And they're meant to be that way. They're meant to stay. And right now, our, our own politicians have orchestrated a full-scale invasion and pillage of an American resources. And then in Ukraine, what happened? The Russians paid no attention to a border that was there. And they've invaded and belligerent. And nobody can stand on anything and say, look, there's a line here. You don't belong on the other side of it. They don't see it with clarity. You stay over there. I'll stay on my side. I promise not to invade you. You promise not to invade me. We live in peace. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's offensive to, to know that people don't understand that God created nations for the purpose of the protection of the human race. But those influenced by evil can't see it that way. It's just cloudy to them. And I know some very smart people who are for open borders. They're for it. And uh, they're influenced by evil. And their ideology is compassion. They, be, they deserve to enjoy America too. Well, what are they going to do when it's a third world country and we're having a shootout over here? Are they going to enjoy that? No. And just like the Roman Empire was invaded and destroyed, America has got a bleak future if we don't do something. I don't. I think it may be too late. Point nine. The believer influenced by doctrine has both dying grace and eternal reward in phase three. The believer influenced by evil has a painful disciplinary death and no reward in eternity. They're going to be happy as they can be, but resurrection body only. So, Timothy, be influenced by the doctrine that you've learned from me and not by evil. And uh, we're here to go to war against uh, false doctrine, against evil. And he's saying the things that you learn from me are going to give you what you need to win. This battle that you're in. I I also am around some unbelievers and I'm constantly uh, thinking about their salvation knowing that at this point they're negative and not open to the gospel but praying that God would give me the opening to share and knowing when to keep my mouth shut uh, because I know it will be rejected. And God is the one who gives the opportunity, not, not man. And you know when it's right. One of the things that's on my mind when I think of an unbeliever is the fact that 60% of Bible prophecy has already been fulfilled. And uh, I think that's a good point when you're working with an unbeliever because uh, he's skeptical about uh, the Bible and Christianity 
But uh, the f it's a fact that 60% of the prophecies of the Bible have been fulfilled and with great accuracy. I'm going to share with you from Isaiah 53. This was written 700 years before Christ was born. And it prophesied not only his life, but how he would die. Isaiah says, who has believed our report? And that means that there were unbelievers in his day. And uh, he still had the message. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? That's his power. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. Now remember, the root of Jesse is what Jesus is, is called. And what did you have? You had Israel growing as a great tree, but the fifth cycle of discipline cut it off. But what happened? A root from that stump grew underground and now it's, po it's, it's poking up out of the soil. And there is the root of Jesse, Jesus Christ. As a root out of dry, dry ground, he has no form or comeliness. That means that he wasn't a supermodel. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. That means he may have a rough face. He may have calluses. He was a worker. He is despised and rejected by men. And I don't know if you've ever been rejected, but it's one of the most, uh, it's the hardest battle you may face in life is being rejected. And uh, rejection is a, is, it's an arrow that's shot at you and you, you have to learn how to handle rejection if you're going to grow up in Christ uh, because rejection is what they did to Jesus Christ and they rejected him as Messiah and they're going to reject you. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. His grief was in that Israel was in rejection of his Messiahship. As we hid, as it were, our faces from him, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. Peace means the barrier wall was broken down. And by his stripes we are healed from spiritual death, not physical ailments. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's unlimited atonement. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before shears is silent. Though he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked. That means he was crucified between two thieves. and But with the rich at his deaths. He was buried in a rich man's grave. Because he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, that's believers, 
He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Hebrew says, For the joy that was set before him he endured. In Hebrews 2.10 it says he brought many sons into glory. He was thinking of you on the cross is what it means. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. That's super grace believers. Because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Well, there's a beautiful prophecy from Isaiah written 700 years before the cross. And even to the, this day, the Jews, when they come to Isaiah 53 in the scroll, they scroll right by. It is so powerful. They will not read it because they are scared someone will believe in Jesus the Christ. Well, from the Old Testament, Timothy was going to have to go to war. He was going to have to stand up for doctrine. And he was going to have to not be influenced by evil. We'll continue on looking at uh, the field order that he received on next Wednesday night. Let's bow our heads together and we'll pray and be dismissed. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you for giving us your word so that we don't have to be carried away by false doctrine, and that we can stand on the truth and know what your plan is, Father, and maybe even one day point somebody else in the right direction. We thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.